Become a patron of Acid Horizon today. This is Acid Horizon, a theory podcast which confronts global crisis and the specter of a world that could be free. This is episode 29, Gilles Deleuze's Postscripts on Societies of Control. Thank you for joining us. Welcome to Acid Horizon, the theory podcast. Today, we present an analysis of a very important essay in the works of Gilles Deleuze, Postscripts on Societies of Control. In this essay, Deleuze foregrounds the importance of methods of societal control in comparison to what we might understand as methods of discipline. Will, maybe you can start us out, give us a little history of this essay, contextualize it, and maybe say why this essay is an important one for Deleuze. So I'm going to start this essay with a contextualization around Acid Horizon. Um, in a sense, uh, closing out 2020 with a return to Deleuze in this fashion is particularly in step with what we do here. Because this essay was written in 1991, published in the October journal, you know, that October, in 1992. And it is Deleuze's kind of contribution to Foucault's disciplinary society. Deleuze opens with like just a wonderful description of uh, the disciplinary technologies that Foucault outlines in DNP. And he talks about this scene in Rossellini's Europa 51, the socialist realist film, where uh, Irene, when she's trying to talk about why she believes that the sort of fascistic, labor-oriented disposition of her husband is depressing. She, she says that in a vision where she saw laborers, she thought that she was seeing convicts. And Deleuze says that in disciplinary societies, bodies move from enclosed space to enclosed space, right? The child goes from his family household to school, and the school teacher says, you're no longer at home, you're no longer in the family. Then the child is drafted to fight in Vietnam or something, right? And the first thing that the drill instructor will say is like, you maggots, you're no longer in school. Why don't you op operate this way or that way? And uh, then occasionally the prison or the hospital and so on. And all of these things are enclosed environments, but they reach a sort of general point of alteration, which is the introduction of this newer technology, which allows for the subject to exist sort of in an open field. It's no longer a discontinuity, right? Where every single time this subject enters a new space, he or she or they have to start at uh, zero. Right, it's a continual system that is open. The corporation is not the factory floor. The corporation is this gaseous presence that flows through the subject. So, in a sense, the tension is one between enclosure and openness, which is why the two theorists that Foucault is going to operate with here until he gets to Guattari at the very end are going to be Paul Virilio and Michel. Go. So I think that's a good place to start is the open versus the closed. But of course, this is a really dense essay and it's only four pages. So we're going to work our way through this thing pretty slowly because it, it deserves that, I think. What we'll do now is start off, what are our major impressions? What really stands out in this essay to us? How does it connect to our research? And for that, we'll start with Matt, then we'll go to Adam. And I'll come in with something and then Will will take it from there. I think one of the things that stands out, um, and it can't help but stand out when you when you read this essay, is how prescient it really really is or was, right? Um, given how long ago it was written, um, you know, the extent to which it, it, it can explain so much of what we see and experience in the world today is, is, is quite incredible, I think. Um, in particular, um, the extent to which... Um, not just social media, although I, I think you know Deleuze's idea of control definitely can understand that better than any other form of understanding power. Um, but but the internet more broadly, um, the uh, the extent to which various forms of consumer technology have become part and parcel of our lives, um, and also the um, the role of 
um, data, uh, you know, data and information, um, not just in the um, the sort of you know material base of the economy, but also in terms of how we um, think about ourselves, who we are, and what our purpose is, and um, how we relate to ourselves and to society. It speaks to all of these things in a way which you know shouldn't really be possible given how long ago it was written, right? Um, and there's, you know, there's so many, even on a silly sort of almost superficial level, um, the fact that he sort of thought of the internet and data in terms of a kind of surfing. I mean, even you know, even that by itself is pretty. It's just really, really appreciating. You know, we 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 did. That's the word that became associated today. You know, we, we, people will still say, you know, like surfing the web, right? It's not just that it's prescient, because one of the, one of the things about it, and you know, we, Will's already you know, uh, touched on this, is that it's a really short essay as well. You know, depending on the copy you get, I think it's only about you know four or five pages, maybe six at most. So what that means is that does sort of he gives us a sort of foundation for understanding um, how power now works, right? Those individual sort of areas will need, you know, further investigation, and many theorists have done that since, right? And we're going to talk about, I'm sure, a few of them in this in, in this episode. But it at least gives us many of the right starting points, I think, or like sort of right sort of contextual tools for it. And if I can say one last thing, um, it's that there's a really really brilliant journal article written, written recently by Jason Reed, and I will be bringing it up again later. But it really is very very good. One of the things he the Reed emphasizes is that Foucault basically could only write discipline and punish because the society in which he was living already had one foot out of the door of it right it was it was already starting to transition away from a disciplinary society um, which he describes in that book towards the society of control which Deleuze talks about in this paper and so one of the things that Reed says is that one of the factors involved in why it can be quite hard to sort of see and understand what these forces of control today are is precisely that we haven't taken that step out of the door yet. And so, at least on Reed's reading interpretation, there's a kind of historicism involved there where Foucault could only write Discipline Punch because we had a foot out of the door, we were starting to move away from it. Whereas perhaps now the reason why it's so hard to um, sort of see these forces, I guess, is precisely because we're right in the thick of it. Matt was right in sort of saying, yeah, along with, with Reed, that this is sort of uh, a addition to Foucault's kind of Owl of Minerva move of only ever looking at the era as, it, as it's drawn to its, 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 its closure. But yeah, this essay really, I mean, let's be honest, it, it's a fucking prophecy in terms of the situation we find ourselves in now, especially as regards as, you know, this essay represents um, uh, the first conception that we have of this turning point in how power relates to the fundamental plasticity of the human body on both a symbolic and a, even a biological level, because this, this this uh, regime of control really is a uh, further answer to the question, you know, what can a body do? And I think Deleuze's uh, best conceptual framework for this is, is, is sort of juxtaposing the models of disciplinary molding versus controls modulation. You know, any idea of discipline molds you into a fixed identity and sends you on your way to... Um, produce and act and you know regiment your body's movements according to this identity whereas what control does in its own modularity is it opens things up you know it sets things to be open to be modules that you add on to your body you compete for precarious hours for precarious merits there is no closure to the self in the identity such that you can you know, carry out this close discipline of, of being yourself instead you are affirmed or at least represented as being the plasticity that that you actually are, and as such, power imposes on you certain um, not obligations, but opennesses that aren't entirely optional as to how you conduct your body. In terms of, you know, you can al- you can always be doing better at your job, always doing better at training, moving on and on and on. And it's a logic. Uh, the logic of control really is a logic uh, in, in mathematical terms of addition, of unending addition and conjunction, whereas. The logic of uh, discipline is the logic of equality. You are simply equal to your discipline, and you further the equality of um, confirming that discipline in its in its own uh, in your production of its structures. Whereas control is purely additional. You're always going on and on. You can never complete uh, yourself. But every aspect of yourself that isn't complete, isn't modularly added to, is seen as something that is um, a kind of failure. So it's an entire new. It's an entirely new regime of subjectivation. Which I think you know we are yet to properly understand the consequences of. So I wanted to bring up an essay written by Andrew Culp, um, who we have had on the show before. He's amazing and he does amazing work. What Culp says is that the best way of understanding this paper, written you know very close towards you know the end of the end of Deleuze's life, right, is that 
it's at least partly an attempt on Deleuze's part to reckon with the extent the extent to which at least some of the concepts and ideas which um, he developed, um, probably mostly in the Thousand Plateaus, the extent to which that has been, at least in Culp's view, recuperated under capitalism. You know, if, if the idea is a kind of um, rhizomatic framework, and you know the state's bad, and 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 um, you know we want less control and so on, then you know what Culp says is that. It, it hasn't worked out that way. And so we can sort of understand this paper as an attempt by Deleuze to try and understand what the other routes around this problem might be. That's kind of a bad way of explaining it, I think, but uh, maybe maybe we'll say a bit more about that. I, I want to put a pin in what you say about um, the rhizomatic structure and how capital can sort of recuperate these ideas of molecularity and so on. Because I think there's more, there's more there, and I think we could actually have a lot of really fruitful chit chat about this paper through specifically that. Craig, the, the reason why I think I'm interested in, in what you have to say about this is particularly like your experiences in these spaces that are like generally defined as enclosed environments. And I, I wonder like maybe one place to start, and I'm sorry if this throws you off, but it's been something that I've been thinking about um, for a while because we've been th talking about this paper is like, how do you feel about these ideas of the society of control when you are literally watching uh, bodies get inscribed by prison industrial complexes as a part of your sort of day-to-day -day experience? Well, I could probably answer that on the basis of what I was going to say. So I'll get to that in a second. The one sort of analysis that I wanted to bring in, or at least the commentary on the text that I wanted to bring in, was this text as being a potential entry point into the work of Deleuze. For some people, this is the very first thing that they might encounter by Deleuze, and what a wonderful way to get involved with his work. I would say that his metaphysics and politics, broadly construed, are certainly operative within this text, and maybe are not pronounced in the ways that we would see in other texts like Difference and Repetition, or even Anti-Oedipus for that matter. I just wanted to talk about reading this text and returning to this text and how to consider this text versus other analyses such as Foucault's or, or anyone else's for that matter. Because one of the things about this text, it's a piece of philosophy, but it also functions as a kind of editorial. And like Adam was saying, this is effectively a set of predictions about the 21st century. And so where I think this text really finds its place is that it rebounds off of the historical analyses of Michel Foucault and the work of Virilio, but we also see Deleuze offering us new conceptual tools that bring us into the neoliberal era, taking us out of the Fordist mode of production or the Taylorist mode of production, right? And I think it's important to note that this is not an absolute shift. Societal apparatuses of discipline remain embedded in this new society of control that Deleuze posits. And my argument's going to be that both of these things coexist. They're enmeshed, right, I with, agree. enmeshed with one another. There are operators in our society that are disciplinary, and there are also operators that are control-oriented. And so to get back to your question about the prisons, this is precisely what we see inside spaces of enclosure today. What we are seeing is an infusion of institutions of control, apparatuses of control, into spaces of enclosure, such as the prison. But before I go deeper into that, I just want to focus on the reading of this text itself. Deleuze writes with an incredible economy to the point where each sentence and every phrase is just packed with analysis and pregnant with possibility, to the point that nothing can really be skipped over here. And I'm just reflecting on my first reading of this, however many years ago that was, and my reading of it this morning, and how much I was able to get out that I didn't notice back then that I noticed today. And there are sentences in, in here that I would have taken them to be grace notes in the past. But to me, those sentences now, after having read Deleuze, whoa, those are major accents. The, the ones that I point out might be able to kick off our discussion as we move forward. I also want to talk about what we might call the predictions or the intimations of what the future of societies of control look like in this paper. I once read a paper about Deleuze and Foucault that focused on the postscripts, and I can't recall the name of the author or the name of the paper, but what they tried to do in the paper was position Foucault against Deleuze, basically deeming him the better analyst of social conditions of the time. 
based on what I initially said and the analysis that I'm committed to, that's a non-starter for me here. In fact, I want to propose a way that we can read what we might call the predictions or the sort of outlines of societies of control as they are developing in Deleuze's analysis. And some of these predictions, we can easily map onto things that we experience today in the 21st century. But in some cases, there's going to be tightening and loosening of the screws somewhere to make Deleuze's writing work better. I think a good way to approach this text is to see that what Deleuze is doing is creating the contours and the outline of societies of control. He's not necessarily offering us an exhaustive list of things that make up a society of control. One of the ways that we can use this text is like Descartes' ball of wax or use it as a matrix for us to meditate upon how the outline that he has offered us has taken shape over the past 20 to 30 years since his death. And I just wanted to point to what I thought was one of the most important pieces in this text. And it starts off section two, entitled Logic. Um, and I'll actually just read that because this it blew me away reading it for the umpteenth time today. Deleuze says, the different internments or spaces of enclosure, and this could be all sorts of things. It can be a prison, it can be a school or what have you through which the individual passes are independent variables. Each time one is supposed to start from zero, and although a common language for all these places exists, it is analogical. And to me, the, the, the key word here is this word zero, meaning right. that you know when you go from the school to the prison, there's a sense in which we're starting over again, but also we're not starting over. That zero that's input into the system of the society of control is not a gap. It is in one sense, but it is a connector. And I think one of the sort of microcosmic ways, um, you know, just kind of on my meditation of this text today, one of the microcosmic ways to think about this zero is just being stuck in a call queue or being stuck in bureaucracy, where you go from one organ of the bureaucracy to the other, or you get transferred from one customer service associate to the other, where you have to retell your story all over again, make all the appeals all over again as you get bounced around. Something like that is happening at the macro level in society too. And I was hoping that, that my, my little meditation on that and my notice of that line would sort of kick off a discussion. I mean, it's, it's almost, uh, you could say, Almost Kafkaesque. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 I mean, like I, I, I've been spending the, the last few days of my life on the phone with the bank, my leasing office, the, the HR department at my school. Like, it, I mean, it, the Kafkaesque element is here. And of course, like he cites the trial. Um, but I think zero is, is a particularly important one when it comes to an analysis of Foucault, because I, I, the thing about Deleuze, I think, is he has one of the like deepest, most complex readings of the work of Michel Foucault. Um, and in a sense, I I just don't like this idea that that what we have to see in the postscripts, uh, the postscript here, is some sort of critique. I don't think that's what this is. I don't think that's what Deleuze is interested in. If anything, it's taking the very sort of new historicist approach that we get or elements of it that we get in Foucault and sort of extending it. And the zero sort of shows that Deleuze actually has some additive properties here because every single time one of these bodies enters this new space, right? You're no longer in the school. You're no longer uh, at home. This is sort of a, a point of beginning. New, new skills need to be developed, whereas in the society of control, the very basis is this, is this person is a set of data, and on the exterior, we can alter the way in which this data is oriented to these particular institutions through which it will pass through, right? Like Guattari has this idea in, that, that Deleuze presents in the essay where an individual can go through particular gates, but not others on the basis of the data that they present. Um, you know, the, 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 the key distinction 
that Deleuze makes between his position uh, of the new, the, the society to come uh, and sort of this malignant form of a people to come is the difference between the hospital and the hospital system, the new medicine without doctor or patient, where it's no longer about the visible and the articulable uh, elements of the patient in the hospital, as we see in like the birth of the clinic and madness and civilization, this de uh, delineation of visibility and uh, the articulable, uh, it is now sort of um, sussing out particular subjects at risk. It's at the very front end of the process. It's it's cybernetic in a sense. Um, so I think that your analysis, Craig, is is particularly good, and I think you're right to push back against this notion that like what we're that one way we're supposed to see this is some sort of of critique of Foucault and that we have to make some sort of choice because I'm not going to, I'm not going to pick a poison here. Who wore it better? Delicious yeah, I don't, Foucault, like, right? <laughs> I don't give a shit. <laughs> right? The whole point is to look for new weapons, right? So you need to, it's, you need to, to understand your, your enemy now. And it's important to understand your enemy then. Um, but I know that Adam has some notes about zero. So before we move on, I want, just want to make sure, and we can take that as my, my contribution to, to my reading of the text, but uh, I just want to let Adam speak. In regarding sort of crazy original meditation, I think, yeah, we have to think the, these two texts here, I mean, you know, in terms of this Discipline and punish versus the postscripts on society's control. And, you know, I, I read this the notion of a postscript as being a postscript to discipline and, and punish. But fundamentally, these, these two texts here are, you read them on two different levels of, of temporality because, in a sense, you know, when Deleuze makes a distinction between the mold and the module, discipline and punish, you know, is, is meant to provide this retroactive sort of summation of what it means to be disciplinary society. It gives you the mold of that society, what, what the identity of disciplinary society is. Whereas because Deleuze is talking about society that is only just coming to existence and which will develop and will continue to develop, there's a future-oriented additional sort of practice to it. There is There are modules to control that will be built on and built into it. But to, to come to zero, zero for someone like Foucault is some you know, the zero point of entering into school, entering to hospital, entering to uh, the military. It's a state of being unformed, of being unidentical with the discipline that you are about to be processed into, of not being yet a soldier, not being yet a model student, not being yet a picture of health. Whereas the zero for Deleuze in the Society of Control is a zero that isn't put in the frame of the institution where, you know, it, you, you know the institution can fail to make you a, uh, a soldier, a healthy person, a well-formed student and educated person. The institution is not burdened with this zero in, in control. In control, you are, because the zero point in control is being unactualized. And when Deleuze is talking about unnaturalization, He's talking about how power frames it as a lack of motivation. You are simply not motivated enough to take on the extra hours, to go into the grind, to take on these extra modules of work and power onto yourself. And I think this, yeah, the zero is completely transformed into this, not a lack of equality between the discipline and yourself, but a lack of um, addition, a lack of the grind, a lack of taking on. And this is where the, the entire system enters into a, a very sort of spurious infinity of always adding again and again and again onto these different codes, and uh, not even identity, but simply codes and accesses and different means of sub subjectivizing yourself. In a certain sense, though, on top of that, I still think that the notion of subjectivation is important there. And Deleuze being sort of a, a Foucault scholar, um, I see an element of the, the second volume of the history of sexuality there, where uh, Foucault sort of sees elements of of the laws in Plato's Republic as as not only um articulations of forming acropolises but of ac acropolises of the self that one must also defeat oneself um and in a sense that this notion of like uh you know you're simply you don't have the work ethic and so on like what Deleuze and Foucault do is like they keep us outside of that like the very uh the I'm I botched that pronunciation but the the, the that sort of uh, protestant worth work ethic sort of shit that we get in in early in early sociological analysis this is something entirely new and it's still fundamentally reliant on 
Foucault's work. So in a sense where we, we you know, uh, Foucault uh, is like the owl of Minerva in that it can only like, it, he can only retroactively, you know, identify these things. In a sense, the postscript can't exist without discipline and punish and, and the history of sexuality. And I don't think that this necessarily brushes up against that. But what I love about your, your analysis of the zero is that um, this idea that the subject now is 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 purely just a a risk. It's an individuated risk. It's the individual, right? Whereas um, the society of discipline is one where uh, it's abnormality that is sort of uh, institutionalized, reformed in such a way that it can become a part of this. Uh, hierarchized but homogenized group and then it can operate but like there's still a tension between i think the society of discipline and the society of control and i think craig's point about uh how these two things can coexist i think is 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 a particularly interesting one because i'm reminded of an episode that we did a long time ago <laughs> now early pandemic uh we talked about heart and negri where uh the industrial uh, economy and the information economy, one doesn't always simply just overtake the other and it becomes sort of the sole form. One becomes dominant, but is still fundamentally reliant on the axioms of the system that preceded it. In a certain sense, I think the same argument can be made about the transition from disciplinary societies to societies of control. And I, I think if we are to go from sovereign power to disciplinary power to the power of control, the old axiomatic still sort of lingers in the newer formulation in this way that's comparable to how empire sort of histor uh, historically analyzes the development of capital. If I could just sort of sum up my thoughts on zero, I guess the disciplinary method focuses more on the aspect of being insofar as the zero level is where you can become to be something to you know, to be you another know, identity, whereas control right. emphasizes the becoming aspect because you only exist to become something further, to become something else of addition. In 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 being in in being disciplined, you uh, only ever become the being of a, of a fixed identity, of a mm -hmm. fixed discipline. Whereas in control, you are all you are completely trapped in the flows of becoming. And sometimes I wonder about Benjamin Noyes and his uh, book *Sense of Negative*, where he he does sort of bring up the possibility that after Deleuze writes this postscript, he wonders why Deleuze never rethought his uh, philosophy of becoming as something uh, somewhat recuperated or something undermined by this discovery. Right. This is something that 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 Matt and I have discussed sort of outside of Acid Horizon. Like, I think I tweeted the other day, like, you know, if you can just get Matt with like a beer and on Discord, you can like kind of extract from from uh, from him these these relatively fascinating uh, <laughs> monologues. But one of them is 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 this uh, sort of critique that Gilles Chatelet, and it's like it's like a passing critique and it's not a real one because Chatelet has deep admiration for Felix Guattari and uh Guattari and uh Gilles Deleuze um but he sort of says that capital can like uh deterritorialize decode faster than like any of your like molecular revolutionary bodies can come from the outside like a war machine or whatever um but in a sense Deleuze is just you can read anti Oedipus in the same way that you read Capital, right? I think, in a certain sense, that critique of Deleuze is comparable to the tweet that Elon Musk sent out when he was like, "Yeah, you know, uh, Karl Marx loved Capital so much, he wrote a whole book about it." Um, in that, it's a description of a logic of a system, and it doesn't necessarily mean that, 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 that there's no necessary active prescription of revolution that's not also um that's not also something that can be re-territorialized right and craig will be the first person to always say that every deterritorialization is accompanied by a partial or full re-territorialization and to fail to recognize that i think take some of the teeth out of, and I'm not pushing against Benjamin Noyes, like he's a billion times smarter than I am on these issues. I just think that sometimes when Chatelet or others levy these critiques, I think they might miss the fact that it's an exposure of a particular sort of logic or 
uh, functionality of these things. But I, I think Matt would probably have a better point to make than me on this. Not a better one. I would never say that, Will. Uh, <laughs> but I do. Actually, I have my copy of Gilles Chatelet right here. As it's happens. a good book. It's, um, it's, a, it's a good book. Yeah, um, and so I want to, I want to actually, so I can, I can read just a little, a little bit of this because it's worth having a think about. Um, and the entire book is a deeply sort of, um, you know, polemical one, right? He's not really trying to advance, like, at least most of it, like, serious philosophical critiques as much as he's trying to let out a lot of anger he has about, um, uh, capitalism at his time. Um, but he sort of, in this one passage, he takes sort of the voice of capitalism, right? Um, and he never uses, he never speaks of Deleuze and Guattari by name here, right? But what he does say, for example, he says, um, in the voice of capital, it says, you want to affirm difference, and even, if I understand correctly, to affirm the right to difference. Thanks for the gift, but we don't ask quite that much. It was you who helped us work it up. We don't say that any race is superior to any other. Your dad's racism is gone, don't worry. We just say they're different. Isn't modernity respect the difference? You want as little state as possible. If only you knew how much we agreed. It's time to slim down providential state. A fat night watchman is no good to anyone. Um, nomadism, and mobili- uh, nomadism and mobility, you say, here again, you'll be amazed at our audacity. Our companies will nomadize faster than your most switched on backpackers. Um, and he goes on for a little bit past that as well. Um, but, well, this wasn't sort of the main point I was sort of coming, at, coming in at, but I thought, you know, if we're referencing Chatelet, then I, you know, I've got a copyright there and say a little about that. Um, so clearly there is concern, at least in Chatelet's work and in, in, in others' work as well. And, um, that, that some of, at least some of the ideas that, um, Deleuze was developing, at, you know, particularly during, during the later part of his life, um, didn't have the kind of political efficacy that he might have hoped they did. Um, we can maybe leave that discussion either for later or for another time. Um, because there was something I wanted to um, try and speak to here, maybe in order to first he would turn us a little bit to the text, but by the end of it, we'll, we'll also have some working examples we can sort of think through um, as as examples of um, of control, right? Um, so one thing to bear in mind is that I, I, this is taken from Jason Reed's essay again, and you know because I'm relying on it, I'll make sure we we put that in the, in the comment section. It's a brilliant essay. Um, but he, he, one of the things he argues is that there's a continuity between some of the themes here and um, two concepts in particular, which um, Deleuze developed with Guattari in A Thousand Plateaus, um, which are the idea of the, the two concepts which go together of machinic enslavement and social subjection. And so there's a bit in um, an, an essay by Maurizio Lazzarato, who comes up in a moment, um, called The Machine, and it's translated by Mary O'Neill, where he explains what these two terms mean, right? Machinic enslavement and social subjection. Um, so Lazzarato's interpretation is that um, capitalism isn't simply a mode of production, it's a series of devices which of machinic enslavement and social subjection. Um, machine, of course, is metaphorical there in a certain sense. Um, so what it means is that um, we're enslaved to a machine when we are a cog in the wheel, one of the constituent parts enabling the machine to function. We are subjected to the machine when, constituted as its users, we are defined purely by the action that use of the machine demands. Subjection operates at the molar level of the individual, its social dimension, roles, functions, representations. Enslavement, on the other hand, operates at the molecular or pre-individual level, affects, sensations, desires, um, and so on. So those are the two, the two sort of concepts at work here, Reed thinks, in, um, in understanding what's going on with control. And so one of, one of the um, arguments that Reed makes in, in his paper, and the paper's called um, Postscript as Preface, Theorizing Control After Deleuze. One of the, the arguments that he makes is that if control, and this is a quote, if control is defined by forms of power that necessarily work across dispersed social space, then its tools are not just debt, distributed surveillance, or even the descended corporation, but also the technologies that act on the imagination, affect, and desires, shaping desires, and thus the condition of possible actions. And he says, what Maurizio Lazzarato stresses in his own work is that control must be thought of as a form of power that acts on the possibility of actions. Right. And so at least on Reed's um, interpretation of this, and he's building on Lazzarato and Lazzarato is basically deeply indebted to his entire idea of control, particularly the idea of debt. But the idea is that it doesn't just operate through these um, dispersed sort of institutional um, powers of debt in particular is a really powerful one, but also surveillance for use of data and tracking people, you know, thinking back to Deleuze's example of, you know, the, uh, or Qataris, I suppose, the, 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 um, the barrier that opens every time you put the, you scan the card, but of course one day it can just 
you know, um, not, not work. Open, yeah, right. It just doesn't work one day, right? And the card's fine, but the data underlying you as a individual, he would call that's changed, right? Um, so one of the ways I think this is interesting is that um, it doesn't just work through that. What's important is that because it shapes and molds in many ways our desires and investments, um, there's this element of changing what we think is possible and can be done uh, for Reed. Um, and there, I think, you know, if we're, if we're trying to find like a concept for, um, you know, how to think through a situation in which, um, you know, uh, the ways in which um, our desires are, in, are invested and reinvested in the system which exists, the way in which that, um, you know, has come to... Uh, <sighs> weaken the strength of, of our understanding of what, what could be done. What are the alternatives here? What, what are the options? Um, you know, perhaps the concept there is just capitalist realism, right? Um, if capitalism, capitalist realism um, describes any system, it's specifically the state in which we cannot think beyond anything but capital, right? Um, so maybe that's one sort of thread there is that certainly, you know, anyone who reads this can, would probably come to the conclusion that thinking through debt and surveillance and so on, um, these are sort of means through which it operates, certainly. I mean, I think we should talk about those things. Um, but at least on, on this sort of interpretation, um, it has just as much of an effect on um, sort of how we understand the, the range of options open to us. Um, and that's sort of how control works in a certain sense. It limits our the options we have, but without us always necessarily being aware of that. I think we brought up some important concepts, and I want to circle back just to the notion of concept itself so that we are able to get a hold of a very important term that's used in this essay and, and kind of typifies this essay, which is the term individual as being opposed to individual. But maybe before I do that, I just wanted to point out in conjunction with some of my initial comments. I think how important uh, Deleuze's additions to Foucault's political ontology, how important they are in terms of theorizing post-Fordism, and this is something I think we mentioned earlier, you know, connects to our episode on Hart and Negri. You know, we've been using a lot of, uh, of, of terms here, and maybe this is a good time to kind of gather them all up, and hopefully we can jump into a couple of the examples that Deleuze mentions and maybe even venture our own. But there's just some, some terms here. We have individual, individual, watchword, password, going back even further, molds, enclosures, modulation, I interesting terms that Deleuze uses to ar articulate his, his political ontology here. And what I see him doing in this paper, and, and this is going to ground my, my entire thesis that, that Deleuze and Foucault work in tandem, Deleuze here, he's... Offering these concepts, he offers the concept of enclosure not as something in opposition to modulation, but something that pairs with it, right? In the same way that yeah. in Anti-Oedipus, he, you know, they they have the idea of the the break or the cut, right? Or maybe his concept of the fold. I see the the, the notion of an enclosure as being something static. Um, which also also connects with his notion of maybe justice in Ka in the Kafka book that they do, where where law, the sort of static laws, even the walls of the prison themselves, constitute like in some cases a very concrete ontological entity in the social field into which bodies are housed and enclosed. Whereas yeah. we have other things like education, um, religion, ideology, as being the modulators of the society, and 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 what Deleuze is doing here is. I think what we can't forget in his political ontology, and in my, it, this is essentially my uh, vindication of his work here as being, as I said, a um, a compliment to Foucault, is that his political ontology is, in a sense, a continuous surface with breaks, with folds, and I think that's an important way to conceptualize the notion of enclosure against modulation or mold against modulation, uh, the conceptualization of individual against individual, that the introduction of the axiomatic of advanced capitalism under neoliberalism essentially involves a complication of all these terms. And, and so in short, I think it's important to see the intermingling of control and discipline as an intermingling of intensities. 
Deleuze isn't saying that discipline is obsolete under neoliberalism. What he is saying is that the conjunction of enclosures with modulation precipitates more efficacious means of subjectivation under advanced capitalism. And so what, what, what happens is you have an unsettling of the, the old order and then the incorporation of these, these new axioms. And uh, just to bring it full circle here, I was hoping that we could kind of zero in on the example of the notion of the factory and bonuses and contests, because I think this is really a paradigmatic example of what Deleuze is trying to, to say. He's using this example of the factory bonus and contests as a way to, to show like, hey, this is how this logic works. And maybe after that, we can go into the whole thing about, and maybe we'll finish on this, individuality versus individuality, which I think are some of the most important terms here. So- I actually really, I need to say something really briefly. I'm sorry, Adam. Okay. Uh, <laughs> of course. <laughs> I, I, I think you're going to need to cut this back into, into the end of my little rant there just to okay. tie it up. Right. I, want to, I want to say before I forget, because it'll, it'll, it'll make sense, right? So the idea at least is that um, on, on Reed's, in Reed's paper that um, machinic enslavement of control operates on individuals reduced to a series of flows of information, inputs and outputs, aggregated into banks and data, the social subjection of control increasingly engages individuals through fantasies of individual agency and responsibility. So what's got, it always operates on both levels, right? There's both this level on which we're, we're sort of individuals of data, but also on the other hand, there's this sort of it, almost ideological level in which we're, you know, nevertheless sort of sovereign rational agents and so on, responsible for our debts and so on. That's right. And, and so you have the elevation or the valorization, the ever more strengthening notion of the individual under neoliberal capitalism, but all the while, the sort of intensities operating beneath all of that is this hyper-dividualization of the individual. Yeah, I just wanted to go back to the, the watchwords and the password distinction as it relates to notion of a factory and a bonus, because a watchword is something you, know, you look out for, you look out for, you look out for a recognition, you look out for an identity, you look out for someone who's the sort of person can come in. And the password is simply a guarantee of access. If anything, it's 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 less um, enclosed. It's more open to possibilities. And we think about the factory and notion of a, a corporate bonus. You know, the watchword in relation to its work uh, environment is more, is more like looking at someone and go, oh, you know, "Do you work here? Are you wearing uniform? Do you have your identity?" The password is more related to the bonus because the bonus is. Something, something needs to be, needs to be um, at least ideologically, <laughs> the ideological mechanisms of corporate capitalism, something needs to be earned. Something that is always hanging in the balance. So, whereas the watchword of the factory is, do you work here? The password is more of a question of, well, can you work here? Can you make this? Demonstrate it to me. Uh, you know, I'm thinking of the, ex- uh, the example we gave a few episodes ago of the, um, the GameStop competition for people to make uh, dancing TikToks to uh, acquire more work hours. You know, the, preca- the precarity of zero hours contracts isn't a question of, you know, do you work? It's a question of, can you work? Can you get the hours? Can you acquire these work modules, these labor modules? And insofar as the sort of subject that this sort of model presupposes, the, 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 the display system, presupposes something that can be molded into one identity and remains that one identity and practice discipline of that identity. Whereas control uh, sort of admits that the subject is inherently something that's quite deorganized but has an inherent potential for organization. It acknowledges the body of our organs much more. It acknowledges the multiplicity of a body and what a body can do a bit more than, than, than a discipline does. And as such, the body is divided into what it can do and what it can do in terms of modern power is what it can access, what access codes it can grant in terms of, what what access codes, sorry, it can uh, acquire in terms of bonuses, what, you know, what spaces it can get into, who it knows, what it knows, what it can come to know, what positions it can achieve, what connections it can make. And really, you know, this control mechanism is is much more in line with, with Deleuze's ontology. And that's why it's something, I guess, People like Andrew Culp have tried to sort of, in a way, critique from a very radicalized or in darkened Alersian standpoint because it, this, this incredible multiplicity of, of, of control, not individual, seems like something that fits un- uncomfortable well with Deleuze in a way because the subject is completely annihilated in terms of all of its codes. Because, you know, you know, to everyone who's afraid of the COVID vaccine, you don't need to be controlled as an individual. 
the state doesn't want discipline you it already has your you know your various accounts every account you have every password you have it already has you divided up into these little packets you know social security number your likes on twitter likes on facebook likes on instagram you are entirely divided between different accounts there are as many accounts of you as could possibly be, be in the social media age there is no one of you everyone owns a different part and and really the digital is is a function of acknowledging the fundamental plasticity of the human being as we see it today and that's why i think it's so prophetic and that's why it's every attempt we've had in our modern day to um bring it under unified identity has failed because i, I remember uh, a big a bigger uh, priority of the, the new labor government in the uk was bringing forth identity cards and um it was something that already got realized but it's still quite an active part in the mind of um uh, tony blair oh sorry tony <laughs> blair uh, and this never really got real. Okay, we can sense the name right. out. <laughs> no, it's okay. I have a bitch when I said his name, you see. A bleep there. Um, no, I just, I just spat and said it's fine. Um, <laughs> yes, he couldn't quite adequate himself to the society of control. And I think really social media has completely transcended what we think of as the traditional disciplines of being an identity. And that's why the individual is such an important notion for understanding our day and age right now. Yeah, in a certain sense, I think part of. What this is is, uh, you know, the famous interview where you know Foucault is is sitting in like a something that looks like a cathedral, and he says that you know the man before the judge, he looks to the judge and he says, "I demand to be punished." Right? I, I, that's what the plea is, right? It's a it's a reflection of the relation of power and a disclosure of the self, and. I think, in a sense, what I get from your reading, Adam, is when discipline is no longer what the state is concerned with, but in fact, it's on you. And now you perpetually have to have to sort of desire it, right? You have to from from the get go, it, it's when it's when these institutions no longer become mechanisms of creating subjectivities, but instead these subjectivities need to now uh, propel themselves into these institutions. But in a sense, right, this is comparable to what Matt always says about power in Foucault, where he says that it's not necessarily how the, the proverbial hand of power says no to an individual, but rather how it can propel an individual to, to say yes. So I still see this tension here. I, I don't see, you know, the, the power analytic of Foucault completely overwhelmed and purely historical now. Um, so I, th that, that's why for, for, for that reason, like I still have to be on, on, on team team Craig here uh, with that analysis, because even even the subjects, even if this notion of the subject at risk can only exist with the prior axiom of a panoptic society, where individuals are operating as though they are subject to perpetual surveillance. We all operate on Twitter as though the eye of the state pierces our our likes. We do it to each other. Um, so in in a certain sense like uh, what i'm interested in is sort of this this question at the end is like uh, what kind of ways can we find to to disrupt or resist against societies of control uh that don't just um that don't just find themselves rearticulated as new forms of subjectivity under power relations um because i think here the you know, the, the very last sentence becomes the the most important one which is that now that it's been blasted out into the open and exteriority is really important to Foucault the outside is the very thing that is enclosed but the coils of the serpent the serpent are more complex than the burrows of the molehill it's much easier to reject uh to reject these these institutions than it is to reject the various gaseous elements of the corporation because in a sense they too have become imperceptible uh it's impossible for you to know the entire m maximal nature of the edifice that you engage with i remember part of the discussion we had about empire was the fact that like 
a large amount of what you do on the internet, even if it's like organizing, I don't know, like a prison reading group, like getting books to prisoners or something, it's done through AWS, right? Everything is always reifying, even the most, even the most deeply intense forms of rejection always find themselves re-articulating these other edifices or, or even worse, propping them up. So I think that's why these coils are so malignant. And to come back to your earlier question to me, Will, this is one of the reasons that I struggle with my own position as a prison educator, because there's a whole moral narrative that suggests that the work that I'm doing is actually very good. And I mean, on the ground, I can see it. You know, when I'm in the classroom, I'm making connections, I'm teaching people to read. It's really enlivening. It makes me feel great as a worker and as a member of society. But then at the end of the day, taking the macro view, I ask myself the question, am I just fine-tuning the cut between (laughs) societies of discipline and societies of control? Because what happens is a lot of these people who are doing jail time, sometimes for minor offenses or, or what have you, they get released into drug programs, into jobs programs, and none of the other conditions of society change. The axiom of capital is raging as always. They still have to pay inflating rents. Uh, they still can't get loans. You know, they don't have access to the resources that the, um, that the wealthy have. And you know, the, the cycle continues. And so it seems that what I'm doing is, you know, just to sort of reiterate my point, is I'm streamlining the conduit between the enclosure and the systems of modulation. Yeah, there's, there's this sort of really, really evil thing where if you succeed, right, it, even if in a sense you're able to provide some sort of intellectual uh, curiosity or whatever that makes the, the, these individuals uh, feel more attuned to the world, right, we'll take that old saying. And in a sense, like, they do get a job or what have you. Now it's like, oh, look, like our system of enclosure works. Like, look at what we did. Like this man was confined for this period of time. And now he's like a regional manager of a Denny's. <laughs> right, um, exactly. And like in a sense, even though you've done a great thing by putting like the Phaedrus in front of them, uh, <laughs> You know, you've also like, that's an insane, I I just can't imagine. I'm laughing, Will, because uh, just imagining that there's a Phaedrus to Denny's manager pipeline is amazing. (laughs) (laughs) There definitely is. Yeah, but but there's both elements of like, there's both elements of control and discipline there though, right? Um, Because certainly if you're thinking in, you know, Foucault's terms, then, you know, your time in this enclosed space just is that kind of enclosure, right? Um, That's that disciplinary um, space. Um, But increasingly, you know, what we find um, today is that it never really ends there, right? Um, From a range of things like control orders to, you know, house arrests and ankle tags, um, and even beyond that, you know, some of the most um, amazing work that's been done on kind of um, um, critical legal studies, particularly on the question of, you know, um, racially discriminatory uh, practices in the justice system, right? Um, the extent to which that single conviction at a young age um, can prove as a sort of this pivoting point for total control or exercise throughout the rest of that person's life, right? Um, so in that sense, I guess I'm, I'm agreeing with Will in that both of these things coexist in, you know, even in the most obvious example of a, of a sort of disciplinary, uh, prison system. I, I was saying to Will today, I, I was responding to an email that had to do with record keeping related to my job. And basically the last line of it was, we need to keep your record because we have records to keep. Right. It's just what these machines do. They, 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 they will function, uh, you know, I- until they have burned through all of the flesh and corporeal monstrosity that they need to, and they will continue to do so. Like, there's just, I, uh, this is when I get frustrated by, like, like, I don't mean to, to, I'll do this, whatever, I'll get political. Um, <laughs> uh, this is why I get frustrated by, like, liberals who will post, like, that video of like um the 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 train uh moderator audio where they talk about how like if you're not operating correctly you know you're you don't you don't uh, emit the right social affect like your social credit will be de- like d- decreased and so on right and we're like oh my god look at this like disgusting dystopic nightmare we have that here 
like like you, you get evicted once that's it right um and in a sense like the very existence of a credit score like the united states is a country basically tethered together by like different chains of debt like we talk about lines of credit and so on and we talk about a line of credit being this like fundamentally liberating thing right we're having all of these discussions about who historically hasn't gotten lines of credit and so on and we're trying to make this more equal but in a sense what it also shows is it also shows just how deeply in our society functioning within it and participating within it means taking on debt and that's why i think this essay is in so many different ways a crystallization of that one chapter of uh, anti oedipus that i will return to time and time and time again until my body disintegrates or like you know it, like it's just in, in a sense our, our our whole basis for for functioning within society is based on well what debt do you carry who do you owe this or that to and like it's not just like a cultural thing or this like virtue thing that exists in the virtual in the most material sense like the basis of our society is a series of different debts you go into and come out of but you're always in debt you're always in debt you enter into a new one through exiting the other you know you're absolutely right and and so this is what um uh, Maurizio Latorato does i mean um so he was wrote a number of books on this but the main one is um government by debt what he says is that this is basically the the, the, the principal example of a society of control right and it's one of the things which um that jason reed essay um digs into i just didn't have time to go into it and i don't really but one thing i wanted to say because i think we are gonna we're gonna start wrapping up now um i wanted to bring it back to this question of um which, which craig asked earlier you know the figure of you know the you know workers sort of competing for this bonus and so on and and the ways in which control might be exercised there um, this isn't necessarily a, a disagreement with what what Craig is saying, but um, I actually think I think the the, the 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 worker in the factory is precisely the wrong model for for Deleuze in this sense, um, because one of the one of the phenomena that, that that develops and that you're starting to see is that um, worker there is there no longer are the the workers. Um, as a collective in the factory or the business anymore, um, or at least you know there is obviously in some sense, but you know it's a sort of progressive decline of this mode. Um, and instead, what we get is this kind of individualized um, form of work, you know, increasingly remotely, which you know has been sort of um, accelerated during this um, crisis, um, such that workers no longer no longer have this sort of collective identity as um, as workers or as employees, um, but as we sort of reformulated, remodulated as um, entrepreneurial individuals. And so this is actually the point of departure in many ways for Hart and Negri's work. And we've talked about them before, but, but their, their sort of gambit, their bet in this is that in an almost inverse um, proportion to um, the extent to which we um, work as whatever or are, are ind individualized away from the factory floor, um, in an inverse proportion, um, the, te the technology involved in the means of, co of cooperation and communication um, develop at the same pace, right? And so their sort of gambit in many ways is that um, in, in a certain way, still in a sort of Marxist sense, capital nevertheless creates the conditions of its own um, destruction because, yes, you individualize them away from the factory, but by sort of um, exploding the extent of the communication and cooperation possible, through things like the internet and phones and, and so on, um, it also lays the groundwork for a much more um, uh, communal, you know, communized, um, cooperative um, movement and society. And that's sort of their, their, their bet about this is that, you know, we are going to see, you know, the end of this traditional model. And that's sort of what they say, this sort of changing the class composition, right? Um, but there are always new openings, right? New weapons, new tools. Um, and that's where they think at least one of the big ones is going to be. It's that I'll just repeat myself in now, sorry, but but you know that yes, we lose the kind of collective worker sort of identity sort of thing. But what we do get, and this is a possible a possible way out, is this um, huge opportunities of, of um, uh, communication and cooperation. Um, but of course, you know, Deleuze is skeptical about that. You know, perhaps we have too much communication, as he said in an interview with Negri. Perhaps it's about uh, finding new. New vacuoles, new 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 moments to be silent rather than uh, to communicate more. 
Okay, maybe we'll start wrapping up. Um, Adam, what's your big takeaway from this? Go ahead. I'm just wondering whether this this dawn of a kind of modular uh, model of control is also a, quite an opportunity because the modular, in so far as Deleuze is thinking about it in his very uh, additional kind of model, is a logic of unending potentiality and unending attachment. But the thing is that modules really is they're also as he acknowledges. Uh, a great vehicle of separability and detachment. There is potential for a decentralized uh, model of, of modularity. I, I do wonder if this has a potential for the, the decentralization of something like, you know, maybe Tukernia's committee would, would call a commune. The idea of a module is also something similar to a, like a standard template construct in a science fiction novel. And I wonder if this this system does give us new ways of, if we reclaim it from the structures of capital and structures of power, that reduce them maybe we can sort of capture the plasticity of our own bodies and our own symbolic uh, positioning that has been held back from us by capital if anything maybe this is something that has been shown before us and represented before us that we only need to reclaim if we can reclaim the uh, potentiality for us to be disorganized and reorganized along these lines of potentiality and these lines of addition then maybe we can actually form a, a better differentiated picture of ourselves in this sense, maybe the society of control is something that we can appropriate for a society of self-control, a society of decentralized modularity of ourselves that we do not become fixed within these molds of, of discipline. And I've, I think you know, the new weapons could actually be the, the weapons of which we used to uh, reappropriate this. The dawn of control has been the violence imposition of a kind of plastic explosive upon, upon the, uh, the human body, or just bodies in general. And plastic, if you remember, is, is, a, is an adjective, not a noun. I think maybe if we, uh, in highly parodical and in Minecraft terms, reorganize ourselves into a kind of plastic explosive assemblage of a decentralized commune, then maybe, maybe this is the path to a kind of um, a new form of plastic autonomy. Will, what do you got for the end? Yeah, so quick, quick response to Adam. I think you get some of that in Foucault's third volume of the history of sexuality with the politics of friendship and the the disclosing of of secrets and the forming of these like small uh, political units. But I want to close with this because I, I want to close with Deleuze as Foucauldian here, and Deleuze saw Foucault writing about the things he did because. He, Foucault saw these structures as intolerable. And he makes the point not to say tolerable, intolerable necessarily because unjust, but because they were imperceptible in the particular discipline and in the social body. He, he writes to expose, to give face to these barbarities, these technologies of power, and so on. And what I actually see here is Deleuze seeing the technology of control as intolerable. And he has to sort of, he has to sort of, uh, because no one sees it, he has to articulate it. Because if there's one thing that Foucault and Deleuze agree on is that thought and articulation is already bound up together that there isn't an extraordinary di distance between like we'll see like theory nerds on twitter fight but between theory and praxis and so on this to Deleuze is a form of praxis it is a an ex it is an exposure of the intolerable that no one else sees and in that sense it really is a moving through and beyond, but still carrying with Foucault. And that's what I see in this essay, I think. I think the important point that we brought up at the end was the importance of debt when it comes to societies of control. And I just wanted to use this as a moment to plug an upcoming episode that we have on Deleuze's essay, To Have Done With Judgment, in conjunction with perhaps a reading of Artaud, and how in that essay Deleuze identifies, via Nietzsche, the importance of the establishment of the creditor-debtor relationship 
as the basis of society and political economy. And so I think it's important to see that in the political milieu that Deleuze is addressing and analyzing that, and especially in the year 2020, what does it say about our society that debt has been proliferating more and more? I mean, have you looked at the federal debt that the United States holds right now, the amount of debt that students across the United States hold? Countries like Japan, for instance, as recent as 25 or 30 years ago, debt, personal debt was not a major facet of their society, but is exploding today. Um, what does that say about the nature of capitalism and the prospects for overturning some of the most vile elements of this system? So with that said, I think I'm going to give the last word to Matt because it seems like he can run a marathon or two today. Uh, Matt, what do you got? <laughs> Yeah, no, I mean, that's fair. I think I've gone on a little bit this this episode, but uh, maybe I don't know. That's my that's my fault. But um, yeah, I, I think um, I don't know that I want to add much other than to say that yeah, debt debt is um, a really important way of understanding how control works today. Um, uh, Lazzarato is a really really key thinker there, and if I can just say you know a, a tiny bit about that, um, given what I was saying earlier about Reed's Reed's essay, um, one of the things that um, debt does is it simultaneously reduces the individual to the individual to these sort of credit records, credit scores, um, lists of bills, and so on. Um, you know, incomes, all the rest of it, right? These sort of individuals, while at the same time engaging in this kind of moralization process, right? So that you're you're not just the individual. It's this kind of double movement where you're you are these sort of individual pieces, which you know, as we all know, these. You know, private credit companies have on record and so on. But at the same time, we're also m sort of moralized into being these sovereign citizens who are, you know, um, not only rational, but therefore also morally responsible, right? Um, so that we're also um, guilty of poor management, you know, um, poorly managing our finances, but also responsible for. Um, thinking about what we do with that debt and so on in the, and credit or whatever in the future, which is also how it kind of forecloses some of these possibilities for thinking and acting. Um, so that that's another key element. But um, just you know, beyond that, I think it's a really, really important essay. And I think um, it says a lot that so many thinkers and theorists since Deleuze wrote this have been so reliant on it, you know, and have done so much work with it. Um, I think it's a really great point to start with um, if you're sort of interested in Deleuze and, you know, especially if you're interested in what he has to say about politics today, uh, sort of political theory. Um, yeah, I'll leave it there.
Thank mm-hmm. you.